Thanks a lot for joining me for this talk about serverless application and uh, application security testing. We will see what are the challenges that uh, we face when uh, having a building a security testing tool for serverless application. So a bit about myself, if you don't know me yet. Uh, I am a developer, software engineer, I started coding as a young kid uh, 30 years ago. I uh, done my PhD in critical software safety, basically helping uh, that uh, code that is a nuclear plant and so on will not explode and uh, kill people. And then 15 years ago, I moved to, from software safety to software security. Uh, worked a bit on uh, interesting soft, on making uh, SSL library more safe, uh, actually giving some mathematical proofs that you, you can trust some SSL libraries, and then continues um, working on uh, application security tools, static, static analysis, SAS, TIAS, SCA, uh, and so on. And now I am uh, the technical leader uh, of uh, serverless engines at Contrast Security. And uh, this talk is about serverless, so I will talk more about that. Yeah, okay, uh, okay cl cloud native application is gaining in popularity. We see more and more customers that are uh, moving to the cloud and not only moving to the cloud, but moving to serverless architecture. Uh, some of them are already full uh, in the serverless world and some of them have some hybrid, uh, some existing uh, application and some new application with serverless. But we see always that uh, now everyone is moving to the cloud and particular serverless. Uh, this is a slide from uh, AWS. This is the scale we are talking about. Uh, now AWS has hundreds of thousands of customers that are using serverless application. Uh, and if you, if you take a look at every month, Lambda execution, you have trillions of them. So it is uh, already a major player in the software architecture and it is only the beginning. And now we can see more and more attacks uh, in serverless applications. Some of them are specifically tailored for serverless application. We have seen this uh, Denonia uh, uh, a few months ago, where uh, some malware was introduced in serverless application. And this is the first time that it is at this scale, but again, this is only the beginning. And also all the well-known vulnerabilities like log, Log4J is one, one example. Uh, it is all, not specific to serverless, but it is also relevant for serverless application. Now, serverless is not just a development pattern. It is more than that. We have seen a huge uh, transformation in the software industry, the way we are developing software. Uh, starting from the decision making. Now we don't have managers that are deciding everything, but we, we uh, developers have a lot more power. Developers have the say, uh, choosing the right uh, architecture, choosing the right uh, technology for some patterns. And this goes well with, uh, with serverless. Uh, the process are different, the life cycles of, of software uh, is different. We want everything to be automated. We want to deliver value very fast to the customer. Um, so we have the DevOps, the DevSecOps trend, and so on. So uh, this is uh, the world of, of serverless. And last but not least, the architecture is really different. If we are talking about serverless, we are talking not only microservices, but uh, nano services. We, we have our application is no more a big monolith but it is split in many, many uh, very small components, very small services that are communicating 
uh, to one another. So this is an example of uh, serverless application. You can see here the architecture. This is a very small application. Uh, a few dozens of uh, Lambda, uh, Lambda functions here and other services. You have API gateway and so on. This is a very small application and you, you, you need to understand that uh, customers have hundreds of Lambda functions, thousands of Lambda functions in a single application. So this is important to remember when we, we will talk about security and how we can uh, effectively give a security solution for, for those. So if we, if we zoom in uh, in a Lambda function, what is a Lambda function, how it works? You have uh, the Lambda function, you have, the, you have your code uh, in the middle, the Lambda function, this is your code, but your code is not running in a server. You, you don't have, as in a traditional web application, a server that is running, listening for a request and so on. You have your code somewhere in the cloud. And when an event is coming in, the cloud provider is creating a temporary ephemeral container that will run your code. And this is really new. Uh, this is uh, in the event-driven architecture. The events that are uh, coming through can come from various places, it can come from not only a REST API, but also uh, uploading a file to a S3 bucket, changing some field in a database, uh, and so on and so forth, IoT, and we have a lot, a lot of uh, possible uh, events. Each event can trigger your code, it will create a container and run your code, and the container will die a few moments later. When your code is running, it will interact with many services that are running in the cloud and in order to interact with those uh, services it requires some permissions and we will see in more details how the permissions are um, defined and what are the security implications. With this kind of application we are losing the perimeter. We, we no more have one big monolith application with a single uh, with a single place where you can put security at the entrance and listen everything and so on. You need to secure each and every function in your application because the events from attackers can come from anywhere. So you cannot rely on a service that is an internal service uh, talking only with your code uh, to be safe. You need to secure everything, also the inside. Okay, so a few more details about Lambda functions. Um, your Lambda function, as I said, uh, the cloud provider is creating a temporary container that will run your code. This temporary container doesn't really uh, contain interesting things for an hacker, for an attacker that wants to steal your data and so on. Uh, almost all the data is temporary. It will be removed very soon. All the environment is read-only, except for one folder for temporary data. You cannot connect through SSH to, to the container. Uh, so this is a very particular uh, way, and for security, it has implication. For instance, if you have some very uh, uh, critical vulnerability, uh, like uh, command injection, code injection, the impact on your serverless application will not be the same as uh, for a traditional web application. In a traditional web application, you have a code injection. This is game over. The, the attacker can do everything on the server. But here, the attacker will be limited and we will be how. But two things are interesting here. In the Lambda function, in the container, you have your code. Your code is running there, and the source code is in the, in the Lambda function, in the temporary container. And not only that, Another very mo more interesting thing is that you have the keys, the AWS keys. We have said that the small container is uh, discussing with other services in order to discuss. It requires permissions, and the permissions are given through the keys. Basically, the Lambda function is telling to the cloud provider, I have the keys. You can check that I have permission. I want to talk with the database. I want to talk with the S3 bucket, and so on. 
So as an attacker, I want to see your code and I also want to get your keys. And with your keys, I will be able to move in your application to access your database, to access your S3 bucket and so on to, to, to take everyone, everything I want. So let's take a look at the demo, how an attack look like uh, in this kind of application. Here, we will see that we will upload a file and uh, trigger an attack. Okay, so this is a web application that is uh, uh, based on serverless uh, architecture. We log in, we can see the application, the web uh, interface. Uh, we have some form here. We want to send a message to the to the website and okay so it works okay but what we can do here you can see the attach file we can also send a file okay so let's try to to send an image yeah working we can see the, the connection the request and so on and the, the name of the of the file that is uh, sent to the to the server it is just a post a request and upload to s3 bucket but it triggers many things in the in the serverless application. So now what we can do here, we just we will just rename the file. And in the file in the file name we will add some uh, curl uh, request that will extract the data uh, to our own server so that we will uh, be able to um, to steal all the environment variables. And as we said before in the environment variables you have the keys that uh, give you access to other um, to other services in the cloud. So we send the file and we will see that in the backend something is running and in our Android server we get the data. We have received the, our data, we just decode it, it is a uh, base64 decoding the data and we can see all the environment variables we will clean up uh, the data in order to define the profile so that we will be able to use uh, AWS CLI we can see the token, the AWS access key, the secret access key we have a profile now that is already defined so now that we have the keys we can do anything we want with a standard AWS CLI, we can do LS on the S3 bucket. We can see that we have all the S3 bucket. We can see the folders inside the S3 bucket. We are using the profile, yeah? The profile with the stolen AWS keys. So now we can see all the, the files that are in it and we will be able to download the file also that we have. This is the downloading of the file. Yeah, just a second. We'll see name of the file. Downloading it, putting the file in our local temp uh, folder. We can take a look at the file and we will see that not only that we can see and access the file, but we can also uh, modify it. Now we are modify it, modifying the file locally. Okay, so a small edit. And now that we have modified the file locally, we can also upload the new file in the S3 bucket. So we can uh, basically edit anything we want in the S3 bucket of the customers. Okay, this is done. We can now uh, LS again and we can see the files that we have just uploaded. So this is to show you how we can uh, perform an attack on a serverless application. Okay, so now let's take, take, let's take a look at a small example. We have here a small lambda function. This is the code. Small example, just taking an event. 
handling this event and you can see inside it is doing some access to a DynamoDB database uh, just putting uh, an item, putting a new item in the database. You can see here in the red box we have the put item. In order to, to make it work, the developer will write the code, try to run, it will not work because the lambda function doesn't have access to the database. In order to have access, you need to change the configuration and give the lambda function access to the database. Now, most developers are not security experts. They are just looking Stack Overflow, Google it. Uh, my function is not working. I have no access to the database. How can I make it work? And so you will find easily in Stack Overflow many people, many good people that will uh, tell you to put this uh, permission and great, it will work. But there is a big problem. This is a big mistake here. The big mistake is the star. You have a wild card here and basically this function only needs to put a new item in the database. But you are, you are giving permission, full permission to the database. And not only full permission to do any action, to delete all the database, to read the database and so on, but also to all the tables in that database. It means that this function only needs uh, a very specific access to this database for one particular table, but you, gi you give access to everything. So yes, it is working, but as an attacker, I am very happy. If I get your keys, now I can do anything I want in the S3 bucket. So what you need to do in order to, uh, uh, to make more secure and to block the attacker, to limit the, the blast radius of the, of the attacker, you need to give a very specific uh, permission to your Lambda function. Only the put actem action and only the relevant table. So that even if some attacker get access to your keys, to your Lambda function, he will not be able to do many things. Just add a new item in the database. Will not be able to delete, will not be able to read uh, sensitive information for the database, and so on. Uh, so now we can see how we can add more security in, in a Lambda function. But remember, we don't have only one Lambda function. We have a lot, dozens, hundreds, thousands of Lambda functions in one application. We have seen customers with million, uh, more than a, a million of Lambda functions. So how can you do this process at scale? How can you check for each and every Lambda function that it has a correct permission? It is not over permissioned. So, as we said, we have a, a scale issue here. Uh, we have a lot of services and not only that, the code is constantly evolving. We have very frequent deployment, as we said at the beginning, uh, with a fast CI-CD, uh, the DevSecOps and so on. We have everything automated. We have a lot of new deployments every, every day. And so, anytime we change the code, you need to check that it corresponds to the permission. So, it is a lot of work. It cannot be done manually. If it is not automated, it will not happen. So we need some automatic way uh, to do that. It's difficult to understand what is connected to what in those architecture. Also, uh, we have many developers. We cannot really rely on the developers. Uh, the developers are not security experts and it's hard for them uh, to, to ensure security for large, large scale application. Um, yeah. So let's move on. Uh, so now that we understand a bit more uh, what are the challenges uh, related to security of serverless application, uh, can we just use the existing security tools that uh, we have used until now? Yes, we have a lot of security testing tools. Uh, how can we leverage those tools in order to get more security? So let's take a small example. This is a, a case study from AWS, a very, very small uh, serverless application. You have three Lambda functions here and a few other services. And uh, it is an iRobot that is uh, basically sending a registering request uh, to the server, not to the server, to the serverless application, to an API that will trigger a lot of events inside. And okay, so I want to secure this function. Uh, I can use SCA, 
everybody knows SCA. SCA uh, will able to to give you security warnings, to to tell you that you are using an outdated, vulnerable uh, um, uh, dependency. Uh, your third-party code may be vulnerable, a known CVs, and so on. But if you do that, that's it's great. You need to do that, right? But it it will only address a very small part of the problem. You you will uh, only cover the security uh, vulnerabilities that you are importing with your uh, dependencies. And uh, a re a recent research have shown that it covers only about 10% of your code that is actually running. Even if you don't, you import a lot of uh, third party, a lot of open source libraries, most of the library are, are not actually running with your application. And if you take a look only at the running code, it is only about 10% of, of the application. So this is great, but this is not enough, obviously. What about IAC, Infrastructure as Code? Uh, you have tools, you have even free tools that are available on the market uh, that are scanning your configuration, your Terraform, your Kubernetes, and so on, uh, able to give security warnings. But this will be able to tell you, oh, you are not using encryption on this particular service. But it, it will not address the whole picture. It will not be able to address, for instance, uh, the least privilege violations that we have uh, seen before. And it has zero code coverage. It is not scanning your code. It is only scanning the configuration, the configuration file of your um, IAC. So what about SAST? SAST is a static analysis. It is actually looking at your code, looking at your core code, uh, looking for injection vulnerabilities and so on, a lot of uh, uh, possible uh, vulnerabilities in your code, but there is a big problem. Uh, when you are, if you have already used some uh, SaaS tools, you probably already know that you have a lot of false positives, a lot of false alarms, and this is a big problem. And even more in the serverless architecture, because we have seen that not everything is in the code. You don't have one big monolith with everything inside. All the connection between the services are inside the configuration, not in the code. And the SaaS tool is completely blind to that. The, the SaaS tool is only looking at your as the code of your, of your Lambda function. It doesn't know the connection between the, the services. So it, it would give even more false positive in this case. So th this is a big problem. And also it doesn't address the least privilege violations that you can have. Uh, so what about IAST? IAST interactive uh, security testing. Uh, we hear that uh, it is much more accurate and reliable. We have less false positive and so on. But if you want to deploy some IAST, you need to instrument your server, right? Um, we are serverless here. It, with a traditional application, you instrument your server when you are uh, making your server up once. And after that, it is instrumenting uh, listening to the traffic and so on. Uh, but with a serverless application, when you create a new container every time, you cannot really do efficiently as an instrumentation uh, for each and every small container that is created every time. Uh, containers are living for only for a very short period of time, and time is critical, instrumentation takes time. This is a problem. And there is no actual uh, solution in the market for now uh, doing some IaaS and serverless. So what about Dust? Dynamic uh, security testing. The dynamic, you can do some dynamic uh, testing here with your application. Basically, if you want to use Dust, you need to find an endpoint of your application, send a request, and the Dust will uh, craft uh, the payload of uh, um, the payload to your API try to inject some malicious data inside, some malicious payload, and, and see what is the behavior of your application. But there is a big problem here. This is a coverage problem. Because if you take a look at this kind of application, the Dust will send a request, and uh, most likely, it will only get a response 200 OK, 
I have received uh, the request. I acknowledge that I have received the request. But most of the logic of the application is inside, in other services, because it is an event-driven architecture. So the DAS will on be only be able to discover what is uh, really very close to, to your REST API. And everything that is inside, the DAS will be completely blind to, to what is occurring in the background of your application. So this is only superficial and it will not give you satisfying coverage. So we need something else, right? Uh, so let's try to imagine what we can uh, get as a perfect security solution for serverless. Okay, uh, so we have here our traditional CI CD uh, for a modern application, say a serverless application, and you have a developer, you have an application, uh, an AppSec people here. Uh, what kind of solution do you want to ensure security of your application? You need some things that will cover everything, all the stages of your CI CD pipeline. You want your codes to be scanned, you want your configuration to be scanned, you want it to be accurate, you want it to be uh, friendly to the developers, very easy to use, not yet a lot of false positive and so on. So this, this is the dream that uh, the, the dream security testing tools that you that you can think of. Uh, going it a bit into more details, let's say that we want some things that will install automatically. Maybe one line of code, maybe one three clicks only in the in the UI. Some things that will go inside your cloud and be able to do everything. So what is everything? The first thing is to discover what are the assets that you have in the cloud. What are your resources, what are your Lambda functions, your databases, your S3 bucket, all the services that are deployed in your cloud. If you are talking to customers, uh, people that are using serverless, uh, in a more general way, cloud application, it is very hard to get visibility on what you really have in your cloud. Many, many uh, times, uh, we just ran this d discovery and the customers are surprised to see, oh, I don't know this function uh, from where it is, go it is coming. Maybe some developers that has done some experiments and a Lambda function forget about it and now it is in the cloud. Any vulnerability here, you can get access to an attacker that will be able to enter your application and so on. So this visibility, this discovery, uh, stage is, is very, very important. The second thing is that once uh, you already have a map of everything that is inside your cloud, you want it to be scanned and analyzed. You want to discover all the vulnerabilities that are inside your code, also the vulnerabilities that you are importing in the third party libraries. You want also to understand the tool, you want the tool to understand the flow in this, uh, in this serverless application because remember you have a lot of uh, microservices talking to one another. Uh, so even if you know what is in your cloud, it is not easy to understand what are the possible flow and who is talking to, to who and what is connected to what. So this is something that you want to be analyzed. And then you will get some kind of uh, list of vulnerabilities that you need to address and when we have talked about uh, SAS, for example, when you get a lot of false positive, here you want to, to have some more confidence that the results that you get from the tool are really real results. And you don't want to lose your time investigating what is the problem with a result that is only a mistake of the tool. So one additional step that you would like to have here is some kind of simulation. If you have something that is inside your cloud, a security solution inside your cloud, would be able to, when we have discovered some possible vulnerability, we have uh, discovered what are the possible payloads that can trigger this vulnerability, we want to test it, we want to simulate it. We want to send this payload, we want to track 
what is the behavior of your application and to check if it is really vulnerable or not. So because the solution is in the, in the cloud, inside your environment, it is able to simulate and also to track the behavior of your application. Uh, for instance, uh, if it is sending some payload in a Lambda function and you expect a new file to be created on the S3 bucket, after it is running, you can check in the S3 bucket if the file exists. And so you can check that uh, the exploit of your vulnerability really works. And so this reduced dramatically the number of false positives. Uh, and then after that, you need, uh, uh, obviously, some uh, reporting in your uh, uh, in the environment that you are using as a developer. You want to get a Slack message. You want to get a, a PR uh, request in your uh, in your GitHub and so on. Maybe a mail. Maybe something else. Uh, whatever you are using, you want it to be um, as actionable as possible, as easy to, to use. So this is, a, let's say, the dream solution, and this is exactly what we are building at Contrast Security. This is uh, uh, what uh, my team are, are working on. Uh, so that is to, to get a, a, some example of the kind of result that you can get from this tool. Uh, for instance, here, we have said previously that we have a problem giving too much permission to a Lambda function. So the kind of result you will get from this tool is exactly a, um, an updated policy that could, you can just copy paste into your, into your cloud that will uh, uh, replace the more the too general permission to a very specific one that will uh, help you to uh, reduce the severity of any attack in your uh, application. The second kind of thing that you can get. So let's say here you have a common injection detected in your code. This is not like a SAS result. Here. The res this result says that you have a common injection. We give you the exact payload that will trigger this common injection. We have verified that this vulnerability, this exploit is uh, really working. And if you want to reproduce it by yourself, you can just take, copy paste the payload, send uh, an event by yourself, and you will see that the exploit is really working. So obviously, this is not a false positive. So if you are interested and want to know more about serverless security, uh, we have published uh, uh, OWASP top 10, uh, similar to the uh, uh, general purpose OWASP top 10, but there is an OWASP uh, serverless top 10 uh, that is more focused on serverless uh, server security risk. So you are invited to, to take a look, and if you are using serverless application and you have some data that you want to share, you can send anonymous data so that the, the next uh, versions of the top 10 will be even more accurate. Uh, I will not enter into all the details here, but uh, this is uh, the top 10 that you can uh, check out online. Uh, and as you can see, this is not only about uh, overprivileged function, but we have a lot of uh, vulnerabilities that are existing in the serverless application, and uh, we need to address everything. Another open source that you may want to check out is a DVSA. This is, um, this is a vulnerable application that we have developed, uh, intentionally vulnerable, uh, in order to, to learn uh, in order to test the security tools uh, that are really discovering the vulnerabilities that are inside. So you can take a look, you can learn from it. Uh, please don't put this in production. This is vulnerable. It will only give you risk in your environment. And so that's it. Any questions? First of all, thanks. Um, this is very AWS specific. Can you say how it's different in GCP or Azure? 
Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, very good question. Yes, uh, uh, along all this talk, I'll talk about uh, uh, AWS uh, Lambda functions. Uh, this is the most popular serverless uh, uh, vendor for now, but uh, also you have Azure, you have GCP, and you have uh, other uh, uh, cloud provider. And uh, basically the same is uh, um, applies also to other vendor. And also in our solution, we are uh, starting to add uh, um, support. Uh, now we are adding support for Azure, and it will come also for other security uh, or cloud provider vendor. Any more questions? Raise of hand. No. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Uh, if I understand correctly, all of most of the exploits are based on RCE with uh, other privileges. It depends on RCE that allows you to execute code or retrieve the environment variables to get the credentials. Uh, do you know of exploits where without RCE you, ac you can access um, other resources, for example, SQL injection or stuff, uh, that, but something that is common in lambdas and, and a serverless environment? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So yes, uh, the demo I have, see, uh, I have shown here uh, was mostly about uh, some kind of uh, common injection, uh, stealing the AWS keys. But uh, obviously, uh, you, you can do many things without the keys. The keys uh, give you the abilities to, to move from service to service in your serverless application. But if, you, if your uh, Lambda function is talking with an SQL database and you have an SQL injection, this is also relevant uh, for a serverless application. This is not specific to serverless application, but yes, also relevant. Thank you. Any more questions? Mayor, thank you very much.